initiatives. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'll have some pictures in a moment, I presume. Um, I mean, it's a bit daunting to follow on from Sky News presenter, but thank you very much. <laughs> I think I am also um, allowed as... Uh, having been very involved in paediatric oncology improvement work at European level now for over 15 years, uh, to make a plea, actually, I think it would be an absolute disaster if we leave the European uh, community for science and medical research. I mean, it will be, it's quite clear, that, as I'll show you. So, um, you know, what are we doing to try and bring together care and research to sustain improvement for children and young people with cancer? So I showed you the survival curves for children with cancer in the UK, how even from the 1990s to now we've improved by another 10% um, at a population level, which is fantastic. Um, and those sorts of rates of improvement are in fact going on in most European countries. And w we've heard a lot about you know, really fantastic science and biology, but we have to work together now to really be able to do these sorts of studies um, at the scale that is needed. So here on the left we have uh, Europe with the dark blue representing the current members of the European Union. Um, let's hope we don't change colour. Um, this abbreviate, so I want to talk about what SIOP Europe's doing. So SIOP Europe is the European entity of the International Society of Paediatric Oncology. So already you can see for childhood cancer research and care improvement, we function really at a global level. We all know our counterparts in Australasia, um, United States and Canada. And increasingly now we're starting to make links with Japan, China, um, some of the big, there's a big childhood cancer hospital in Cairo, um, which sees as many children with cancer in one place as there are in the whole of the UK each year. Moscow has a similar large institution. The Dutch are building one children's cancer hospital for the whole country that will serve a population of 17 million. So there are leaders and researchers out there who've got huge opportunities to, if, you know, they could become siloed and do it alone, but they don't want to, they want to work in partnership, but we need to be linked in. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see are just the logos of many of the European clinical trial groups. So virtually every type of childhood cancer um, has a group of professionals of all the necessary disciplines you need to treat a child, um, surgeons, oncologists, radiotherapists, radiologists, pharmacists, pathologists, nurses, researchers, etc., who go on, um, who come together around that and, and are really expert in that specific group. And I've immersed myself so much in kidney cancer now that I wouldn't dream of trying to treat a child with brain tumour. I would ask Darren, you know, who, who, who makes that his main focus. And it is complicated, as you've seen, and you really, um, and I think as Lynn said, you, you, you want to know that your child is, is being looked after by someone who's at the forefront of knowledge. Um, also, the structures, and again, CCLG is one of these things that's called a NAFOS, a National Association um, of Paediatric hemato-oncology professionals. So SIOP Europe now has uh, 1,500 individual uh, members, 31 countries involved in its work. And it's really gone from strength to strength, um, as it's not a continental branch of a global society. It is an entity in its own, its own right. It's actually got more members than SIOP. Um, and I think it is our platform for working together um, and, and, and also working with the parliament, working with industry. So what are the unmet needs that we're trying to address? Um, cancer still remains the leading cause of death from disease beyond infancy. As we've heard, the current treatments are toxic. I would put a slight challenge to the fact that using 30-year-old drugs is rubbish. Actually, it means we know how to use them very, very well. And for many childhood cancers, it is very effective. The problem is that certain childhood cancers remain very difficult to treat. And we haven't yet got new treatments that work and our old combinations of drugs, even if we give them at the highest possible intensity, which I know is really hard for families, um, to, to put their child through. And they will have some effect, but they, we already know that the prognosis for certain groups is very poor. But what it does mean is that with the treatments we use now, um, in long-term survivor studies, we're going to hear much more about that in a moment, <clears throat> quite a substantial proportion of survivors will report at least one problem that's bugging them for some time. A, a much smaller proportion will report something really serious. Um, but, and we also know that one in five children will still die within five years of diagnosis. And because most children with cancer are under five, because um, that's half of childhood cancer occurs before the age of five years, and then the second half is between five and ten, uh, 15, 
um, that's a huge amount of life years um, to be lived with the consequences of treatment. But I also want to touch on, and, and this is less of an issue in the United Kingdom, inequality of access to standard of care and to innovative treatments. And I think we've already, I know there's a parent in the audience who's affected by the fact that her country, which is the Republic of Ireland, doesn't provide phase, access to phase one trials for children with cancer, but it won't pay for them to go to another country um, because it's unproven treatment. And I think that's something that a group like this could help, help us solve and overcome. And, um, and we do also know that the incidence of some embryonal tumours is going up slowly. You know, what, what, is, what are the causes of that? What could we do to prevent it? And then there's the whole challenge of research in very rare diseases and the fact that even the commoner childhood cancers, like Wilms tumour, like medulloblastoma, actually can break them down into somewhere between five and ten molecular subgroups, each of which may need different drugs to further optimise their treatments. Now, this is um, a histogram, so a chart, showing the five-year survival rate for all children with cancer in a particular country, and they're just grouped into regions. And what you notice, this is Eastern Europe. So look, you know, for some cancers, they're 20% worse than Western Europe. But even within Western Europe, there are some small differences. Now, we recognize that... Um, Participation in clinical trials and, research, and being treated in centres that are research active is associated with better event-free and overall survival. And that's not just about whether or not a child gets access to new drugs. Probably most of that is due to the fact that centres that are very active in clinical trials are also very expert in applying the standard diagnostic risk stratification and treatments. But we also need, as a community of um, researchers and families affected by childhood cancer, new and affor more affordable models to do clinical research in a prospective way. Uh, and maybe touch on the Saatchi bill sort of, and why that was sort of difficult for the medical profession. Actually, if you get a lot of people just accessing individual drugs and you never really know who got what or what happened to them, it's very hard to know five and ten years later actually what made a difference because survival rates are improving anyway, because quality of care is improving, and you have to do studies in a way that you can address a question. And you don't always have to do this through randomised trials. If you've got very careful documentation of very well characterised patient and tumour populations, you can start to see how introducing a new innovation or new treatment, and you can follow a well characterised population going forward and see what happens to them, you can actually start to answer some questions in a different way that may be a bit cheaper uh, than always doing clinical trials where you have to report every single bit of toxicity through to a uh, pharmacovigilance uh, department. And of course there is a need to improve risk stratification not only on the molecular biology but things like imaging and increasingly now uh, radiotherapy. We know we've got proton beam therapy coming to the United Kingdom operational in a couple of years time. Um, how do we know which child really needs that and benefits? So what has Europe done and what have we already been part of? So for five years, and we just, this grant just finished at the end of last year, we were a partner in a Europe, establishing a European network of excellence, that's a European Commission term, for cancer research in children and adolescents. This was a huge amount of effort. We estimated that probably about over 100 million euros of effort was spent on the work done in this project, but that was the, the only amount of money we could apply from in the framework, seventh framework program. Um, but this really, I think, accelerated bringing together the leukemia and solid tumour groups in Europe, because we invited in Martin Schrapper, who, um, as one of the project coordinators, he leads the international um, <coughs> leukemia studies across Europe. And we did a huge program over five years. But of course, it wasn't just something to do. It was bringing together researchers, and it went from biology to ethics, um, and also work packages on parental involvement. So what we've done now is um, we have... So the next European framework um, programme is called Horizon 2020. And we have been looking at funding opportunities in there to ensure that there's a long-term sustainability strategy for this research platform and of cooperation across Europe. And I already showed you that it, it was published uh, recently. There are seven main areas of aim. Um, and we've heard a lot in the early talks about increasing knowledge, um, new technologies, 
Increasingly now, I'm getting much more interested in the equal access, quality assurance of uh, treating childhood cancer because there's a lot of lives to be saved in that area using existing treatments. Um, and I think we do need to start to understand what causes childhood cancer and are there any opportunities for prevention or reducing risk. Um, and I showed this slide before. So this was just launched last year. The SIOP Europe board um, is actively pursuing this, making this strategy a reality. So the first kickoff meeting of all of the key leaders of these clinical trial groups is in fact um, on the 1st of July, so very soon, two weeks away. Um, and the main agenda is really what's everybody doing, what things can we do that are in common. So when we talked about silos, it is actually very easy if you spend your whole life just thinking about kidney cancer or brain cancer to not necessarily exploit the opportunities of working jointly with people who look after children with other cancer types or adults with cancer. And of course, when you talk about mechanistic-based actions of drugs, um, working with regulators about new trial designs, these, these questions are for everybody and not just cancer, but other types of um, health uh, uh, clinical research. So what else is going on? So at a European level, there was a directive back in 2011 about cross-border health care. And you can, some of it's boring, as, as the previous speaker alluded to with European legislation and so on, but you can read it all at that website if you want to. Um, but what's the purpose of this? You know, the aim of this is really to improve access to highly specialised healthcare for patients who suffer from rare and complex conditions and that require a particular concentration of expertise. So paediatric oncology was one of two disease areas selected as to pilot this approach, and we were successful in winning a grant. Again, it was led by SIOP Europe and our existing ENCA collaboration um, to put in some for this, and it's called, it was originally called Expo Arnet. And the work we've got to do is really define the conditions within childhood cancer that require cross-border health care, and that's obviously working with the experts in each disease group, to establish and formalize, because these already exist informally, what you might call an international tumor board. So that's a multidisciplinary meeting which already takes place in every hospital to discuss every newly diagnosed patient and their response assessments, and if they were to relapse. Um, but to, can we do that at an international level for very rare diseases or complex scenarios? And also to um, develop criteria and define who are the centers of expertise or experience who are willing to offer these complex treatments to children that may come, have started out their cancer treatment at another country or another center. And we also have, through SIOP Europe, developed a document, which again is available online, the European Standards of Care, that define what a pediatric oncology center should have in terms of resources and expertise. Um, so, and then we want to address the needs of long-term survivors, and improve diagnostic accuracy and evidence-based treatment for children with tumours that are so rare that there's never going to be a conventional clinical trial probably for their condition. So at the moment we estimate that about a thousand children a year in Europe die from a curable form of cancer because they're not getting access to the very best quality of standard of care. So that's quite a substantial proportion of the 6,000 that was mentioned. But of course, still the majority are dying because the treatment's not effective enough. And, and this is part of the European initiatives to reduce inequalities in childhood cancer survival and healthcare capabilities. Um, so Expo Arnett's up and running. This is a project that I, in fact, work very hard to pull together, which is more about cancer outcomes research and observation. Unfortunately, we are not successful in getting funding for it through the Horizon 2020. And at the moment, we're looking for at taking it forward in different ways. But these are the project goals of Expo Arnet. Um, provision of health care to children and young people with cancer in a member state that's other than the member state they, they started in. We, as the clinical experts, have to define the conditions, the target groups, and the aim is that we do want to reduce current inequalities and establish these linked up networks. Um, so let me give you an example of renal tumours. So there, we estimate there's about 1,000 renal tumours a year in Europe. Most children are easy to treat. You know, we expect to be able to cure at least three-quarters of children with Wilms tumour with 
old drugs that we know work and surgery and maybe radiotherapy for some of them. But we estimate about a quarter of that is on the challenging patients with tumours in both kidneys, tumour that goes up into the heart, that's metastatic at diagnosis or where there's been relapse or progression and then these very rare other renal tumours that are not Wilms tumours. And then similarly, about 70 adults a year across Europe get Wilms tumour. And the adult oncologists often don't know how to treat it. So how are we going to set up a European system that will help these very small numbers of patients a year when you're looking at a whole continent? So the first thing we're doing, and each of the tumour groups is being asked to do this now, is define a roadmap. And sorry, RTSG stands for Renal Tumour Study Group. So we need to have experts in all of these areas. We need to have a system to receive requests for information. We need to identify the centers that can treat those most complex cases and are able to offer cross-border health care. And we need to have ways for local centers to contact either directly or through their national centers and see and decide what needs to happen. We have very strong links with the Children's Oncology Group. We have mon monthly teleconferences to talk about new drug therapies and trial plans. And we want to be able to build, and I think this is really important, a, a database, a sort of registry of the cases we're asked to advise on that may go cross-border and actually what treatment do they receive and what happened to them. So that when the next case comes along, maybe the next year that's in a similar situation, you start to build up your own learning library um, as well as doing clinical trials. Oops. Um, so this really just, last two slides really, I think outcomes research is a really, really important part of what we're trying to do at a European level. And it's complementary to and the very, very necessary high end biology and targeted therapy. Because this is about everybody. It's about taking co understanding populations affected by childhood cancer, what works best for which types of patients and in what circumstances. So it's the end result of everything we do. And for the vast majority of children with cancer now, we do have treatments that are effective. And many of them don't, you know, don't have too many side effects or sometimes have almost none at all. Um, and how are we going to do outcomes research? Because you can't do any research without funding. And funding is always in short supply. And really, there's huge amounts of data in, in the health systems in, in different countries. There's cancer registration, which is population-based. There's the clinical trial groups, which have very detailed data, but only on the patients that go into the trials. And then there's routine healthcare records. And, you know, can we link these all up and have much more joined-up research between epidemiologists, the, cancer, the health services researchers and routine data managers and the trial groups to actually start to say, can we ask questions in some other way? And I've just listed here some of the challenges at the moment around data collection, data privacy, funding, and so on. And what we're aiming to do is try and develop ways, as most health services are gradually improving their electronic health record. Uh, it's a slow process, but it is happening. It's the direction of travel. That what we really want is a, a joined up health record that will allow us to do outcomes focused research much more efficiently and in a continuous way. Because again, I think you heard from Lindley, there can sometimes be large gaps between one trial closing and the next one opening, whereas this type of approach can be continuous. Um, and I think, you know, these are the key messages. We can use this approach to understand um, differences uh, in between, within countries and inequalities across countries, but it's very, very important that we do this in a standardized way. Um, but uh, you know, in lots of aspects of healthcare, there's lots of evidence that transparent benchmarking drives up quality, um, helps research because you've got well-characterized patient populations, and it reduces variation. But it does need funding, and it absolutely needs public and patient involvement and support, particularly around the access to data, because that is something that's being, um, getting increasingly difficult, both in this country and at a European level. Um, and I think, yes, that's the last slide with the key messages. So I'll stop there and uh, we'll take some questions later. Yeah. Yes, I think we probably should leave questions till later. But thank you very much, Cathy. <laughs>